it gives me great pleasure to introduce, uh, this is our first province-wide rounds with an outside visiting speaker um, who is uh, not local. So this is on another time zone. So Dr. Uh, Gray Hundemer is from the University of Ottawa. He's a, a assistant professor there and has a quite uh, extensive uh, background in um, both epidemiology, medicine, and for some fun facts, uh, he's actually received his uh, MD from v Vanderbilt and his MP from Johns Hopkins, but he actually served as a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force and then uh, worked at the Mass General. So he really comes with a diverse uh, clinical uh, US and Canadian background. He's a Crescent Scholar at the moment and is interested in uh, primary uh, aldosteronism and with all of the uh, new uh, notions and ideas that are now surrounding aldosteronism and progressive kidney disease, I'm really excited for him to uh, give us this talk and welcome Greg on a three hour time zone difference. Um, so uh, welcome. I also want to acknowledge that we're hosting this session uh, on the unceded ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil Tooth Nations and the Métis Charter Community of the Lower Mainland Region and that all of you in different parts of uh, the province uh, are also on your ancestral lands. So Greg, I'll hand it over to you and thank you again for agreeing to do this and, and help us uh, learn a lot. Well, thank you again for the invitation uh, to speak with you today. So um, I will move, let me make sure I can move the slides on here. Yeah, so uh, my talk today is on the evolution of primary aldosteronism. Um, which has been the focus of my research. And I use this uh, picture up front is just to kind of show you that the message is gonna be that we're, what we think of currently as primary aldosteronism is really just in my mind, the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of this condition. Um, so I have nothing to disclose. So for my talk today, um, I'll break it down into three main categories. So I'll start by uh, talking at length about what is primary aldosteronism, because I think there's a lot of confusion just on that kind of simple question. Um, then I'll move on to, is there an unrecognized spectrum of primary aldosteronism, which is where I feel like this field is really headed um, and the landscape is really changing for this, um, for this condition. And finally, I'll talk about some research we've done about how should primary aldosteronism be treated, because the dogma for how we should be treating these patients has kind of been changing over recent years. So I'll start pretty broadly here uh, by talking about hypertension. And as you know, depending on which guideline you look at, there's a multitude of different definitions, but I'll keep it fairly simple here in terms of blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 or being on an antihypertensive medication. And when you look across Canada, um, you can see that over time for both men and women, the prevalence of hypertension is growing over time, which is not a surprise to anybody. Um, and now one in four Canadians has hypertension based on these uh, definitions. And what we're taught in medical school about hypertension, at least what I remember, is we're taught that there's this huge population of people with hypertension and the vast majority, 80, 90%, are what we label as essential hypertension. And there's the small sliver of the pie that's secondary hypertension. And when we think of the secondary causes, we think of obviously primary aldosteronism, which is the focus of the talk today, which is probably the most common of these. Uh, but other things like Cushing's and Pheo and some other kind of more rare causes of hypertension we think of. Um, and then who are we taught in medical school of when to think of these cases and who to screen? Um, well, what we're taught is we think of drug-resistant hypertension, so people on four-plus medications and their blood pressure is still not well controlled, or if they present to the ER with malignant hypertension and end organ damage, or they have a presentation at a young age or other uh, clinical clues. But I think there's some problems with that line of thinking um, in that we we're waiting till these patients are on the ex ex severe end of the spectrum when they may have already kind of irreversible damage. Um, so we may be missing milder forms of these secondary causes. Um, and so are we misclassifying a lot of people as essential hypertension? It's hard to believe that 90% of people have the exact same pathophysiology driving their hypertension. And maybe this is a spectrum of different diseases that we're misclassifying as just essential hypertension. Um, I think we're also probably identifying patients too late in their disease course to tailor therapy to their individual pathophysiology. Um, so what I think is going to be changing over time is rather than this big piece of pie being essential hypertension, that maybe this, there's milder forms of secondary hypertension that maybe it's this big or maybe it's, maybe it's actually the majority of cases 
I think that's something we're discovering over time. Um, so what is primary aldosteronism? Um, so part of the confusion is that there's a number of names uh, for this condition. So it's the same thing as primary hyperaldosteronism and it's the same thing as Kahn syndrome. This is all the same disease. It's just we have mul multiple different names. If you had asked me what the, what the most appropriate name now is, that most people would say primary aldosteronism is what we should be calling this disease. Now, it got the, the term Kahn syndrome because it was discovered by Jerome Kahn at the University of Michigan in the 1950s. And I think it's interesting the, of how it was discovered. So he had a patient come, come to him who was a 34-year-old female, um, and she presented with episodic weakness of her legs. And this wasn't mild. She was actually it was near paralysis. Um, she had muscle spasms and cramps in her hands, and she was found to have severe and resistant hypertension. She also had very profound hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. So this was around the time where um, doctors were learning more about these adrenal steroids. Um, and he thought something was gonna be interesting here in terms of her uh, adrenal physiology. So he, he initially told her she was gonna come in for about a week or two and he was gonna do a bunch of different tests to try to sort out what her issue was. Turns out she was hospitalized for eight months while he was doing a variety of different tests and experiments just to try to sort out what the cause of her presentation was. He ultimately found that she had very high uh, urinary aldosterone levels. Um, at this time, as you can imagine, they didn't have the same imaging that we had now. So he eventually convinced the surgeons to take her to the OR and do an exploratory laparotomy and look at her adrenal glands. Um, and sure enough, when they did that, they found she had a large adrenal adenoma, um, removed it, and her condition basically resolved. Her hypertension went away, her hypokalemia resolved. Um, and soon after this case was reported, many different cases kind of came to the forefront and to this day we're finding more and more of these cases. Now I'll give you some of the basics of primary aldosteronism but I'll go more in detail as we uh, move along the talk but it's the most common endocrine cause of hypertension but it's massively underdiagnosed and I'll give you some numbers about this later. Um, the underlying etiology is this autonomous hypersecretion of aldosterone from the adrenal glands. Um, so these triangles are supposed to represent your adrenal glands. And this is just, just to show you the breakdown that there's a spectrum of disease here where if these are normal adrenal glands and these are primary aldosteronism, about one third of cases, just one adrenal gland is affected, typically due to an adenoma or a Kahn's tumor. The majority of cases or two thirds are bilateral, which is typically due to hyperplasia, but you could also have bilateral nodular disease or uh, another cause where both glands are affected. Now it's important to know that it's far worse prognostically than other causes of hypertension, and this is independent of blood pressure. And I'll talk about this later. The clues we're taught in medical school is severe resistant hypertension, low potassium, uh, metabolic alkalosis, and adrenal nodule. Though, as I'll talk about, a lot of people don't have all of these uh, findings. And there's different first line therapies uh, for this than other forms of hypertension. So we typically think of if you have bilateral disease, we do use MR antagonists for the rest of their life. And if they have unilateral disease, the treatment is generally uh, re surgical removal of that adrenal gland. So I'll give you a vignette here. So say you have a 37 year old man diagnosed with hypertension and you start treatment with a diuretic and calcium channel blocker. He comes back to see you uh, two years later uh, at age 39, and his blood pressure is now 138 over 92 on two medications. You decide to screen for hyperaldosteronism, um, so you check a serum aldo and it's 240, and renin is two. This gives you an aldo to renin ratio of 120 and a potassium of 3.7. So my question for you is, does he have primary aldosteronism? So the first, th when thinking through that case, um, the first question is when and who to screen for primary aldosteronism. And if you look at the guidelines, which the main guidelines for this come from the Endocrine Society, this is who it lists of who we should be screening. So severe resistant hypertension, and you can see the definitions there. And then hypertension plus some other clinical feature. So hypokalemia, and it's important to note that it's spontaneous or diuretic induced. So these patients are not often hypokalemic until you put them on a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic. But even if, if they get uh, hypokalemia on a diuretic, that's still an indication to screen. Hypertension and adrenal mass, hypertension and sleep apnea, and that's because these two diseases have been shown to travel together. Um, some of the conditions, some of the cases are familial, so hypertension in a family member with primary aldosteronism, or hypertension in a family history of early onset hypertension or stroke. So going back to the vignette I, I discussed, 
that patient didn't meet any of these. So at least based on guidelines, we didn't necessarily need a screen. But as I'll talk about, maybe it, maybe it is the right thing to do. So again, the screening tested is, is an aldo to renin ratio. Uh, now, part of the confusion is what is a positive screen when you do an aldo to renin ratio? So if you look at the guidelines, they give you a table that I think makes things even more confusing. Um, so when you look around the world, there's all sorts of measurements for renin. So there's plasma renin activity level in different units and then direct renin concentration. And aldosterone comes in different units as well. So I moved here from Ottawa from Boston and I was used to using aldo in nanograms per deciliter and plasma renin activity level. So I was used to these thresholds. Um, now that I'm in Ottawa, we have used direct renin um, in nanograms per liter and aldosterone in picomoles per liter. So these are the, num the cutoffs that the guidelines recommend we use. Whether they're appropriate or not um, is an area for debate as I'll discuss. Um, but again, why are there two different numbers? Uh, well, it's because these are expert opinion and they can't agree on it either. So if you want a more sensitive test, they say 144. If you want a more specific uh, test, they say 192. So there's, no, there's not even a strong agreement among the, the experts in this field about what the threshold should be. Now, one thing that's often uh, misinterpreted is if you have a high aldo to renin ratio, that's not enough. Your renin should be suppressed with this condition. This is a, a must have for the diagnosis. So, and what is the suppressed renin? Well, PRA, it's, the literature is mostly on PRA because that's been around for longer where they say less than one. For direct renin, there's not a great way to convert between the two, but I generally think of a suppressed renin for a direct renin as less than 10. And this is the very controversial area of how high does your aldosterone level have to be. Um, so they used to say your aldo had to be greater than 420. Um, aldosterone varies a lot in people. So if I check your aldo level now and a few minutes later, they may be very different numbers. Um, and so they used to say greater than 420, but then turns out there were a lot of cases below that threshold. So more commonly now they say less greater than 280. Turns out there's a lot of cases even below that. So this aldo threshold is very controversial. Um, so our patient didn't meet any of these. The ARR wasn't that high and the aldo level wasn't high enough. Though as I'll talk about is that doesn't rule out that he may have some form of primary aldosteronism. And because these, because these thresholds are kind of being refuted over time, there is a new term that's being used called renin-independent aldosteronism instead of primary aldosteronism. And this is vague intentionally. So they're basically saying anybody with suppressed renin and inappropriate or dysregulated aldosterone secretion. So any aldo level that's high relative to what the renin is, you could argue that this patient has some form of, of renin-independent aldosteronism. So I'm always asked how to handle blood pressure medications um, when somebody is checking the ARR. So this is kind of a simplified drawing of the uh, RAS pathway. And so all, all you need to do is think about where these medications affect the RAS pathway. Um, so beta blockers suppress renin secretion. So you're gonna get a decrease in renin and you're gonna get a decrease in anything downstream. So decrease in renin, decrease in aldosterone. ACE and ARBs are more commonly a question um, so of how they affect this. So what ACE and ARBs will do is they'll raise your renin because this, because this is prior in the pathway and it'll de they'll decrease aldosterone. MR antagonists and ENAC inhibitors, these are the ones that are the real problems. So they will both raise renin and aldosterone. Now, when you think about somebody who has primary aldosteronism, they're gonna have autonomous secretion of aldosterone. So everything prior to that in the pathway is very suppressed, including the renin, as I mentioned before. So if you have an ACE or an ARB, where they work, there's not much ACE and there's not much angiotensin II. There's, those are both gonna be suppressed. So ACE and ARBs in somebody who truly has primary aldosteronism do not have a huge effect. The ones that do are MR antagonists and amylaride. So your main concern is mostly false negatives with medications. And I just talked about kind of how these medications affect the ARR. So again, the main issue is with MR antagonists and ENAC inhibitors. The other blood pressure medicines don't have a major effect when checking the ARR. So I generally do not stop them. And you actually can make an argument that you don't need to stop the MR antagonist or a milleride if somebody's on it. What, you, what some people will do is, so say you check an ARR and somebody's on spironolactone. If their renin is still suppressed despite that, the ARR is still valid. And that would be highly reflective that they likely have primary aldosteronism if the renin remains suppressed despite being on spironolactone, which should really be significantly raising the renin. Now, if you check it, if you check the ARR and they're on spironolactone and the renin's not suppressed, 
that's when I would think about holding the MR antagonist for about four to six weeks and then repeating. So again, if a patient's on an ACE, ARB, MR antagonist, or ENAC inhibitors, all medications that should raise renin and your renin's still suppressed, that should make you highly suspicious for primary aldosteronism. So as a profession, we're terrible at screening for primary aldosteronism. And this has been reflected by several recent studies. Um, so, these are, um, so these are different populations they looked at. So this was in resistant hypertension, um, where all of these patients based on guidelines should have been screened. Uh, turns out we screen about 2% uh, of them. And another study found similar numbers when they looked at 37,000 patients with hypertension and hypokalemia, less than 3% were screened. Um, and then of hypertension, hypertension with sleep apnea, again, they should all be screened, it was 3%. And this was another study that came out recently where they looked at something similar. The only time that we did a good job of looking for primary aldosteronism is in people with spontaneous um, hypokalemia and hypertension, where here they found 91%. Um, but you can see all the other criteria for screening, the uptake was very, very low in practice. So just to give you a little bit of framework here, I did want to put in a slide about um, how I work up a patient for primary aldosteronism. So first you have to suspect it, and we talked about checking the ARR. And again, a positive screen is a suppressed renin and an elevated ARR, depending on what threshold you're gonna to choose to use. Though it's typically not enough. Um, so many, some cases that's enough if they have, if the phenotype is very uh, classic for primary aldosteronism. If, Otherwise, a lot of cases still need confirmatory testing. So the ARR is just a screen. There's different confirmatory tests you can do and they're all aldosterone suppression tests. Um, what I typically do is the oral sodium load where I put somebody on a high salt diet for three days uh, and then check their 24 hour urine aldosterone level. So that's a confirmatory test to prove that somebody has primary aldosteronism. What you need to do after that is you need to figure out if one adrenal gland or both are affected. Um, and that's called localization. And you do that in two steps. So you get imaging, which is usually through an adrenal CT or MRI. And then if, you, if your patient is young and healthy enough to undergo surgery, if you find that they have unilateral disease, you generally need to do adrenal venous sampling. And that's sampling blood from uh, both adrenals just to see which one is the source. And again, if you find it's one side, the best treatment is surgical therapy, which, which is adrenalectomy. And if it's both sides, it's medical therapy with MR antagonists. Now, I'll remind you that not all hyperaldosteronism is the same. So some, the most common form of hyperaldosteronism is actually renin dependent, and this is a normal physiologic response. So the most common setting would be intravascular volume depletion. So say your volume depleted. Your kidney sense this and secrete renin, which leads to an increase in angiotensin II. Now, if you look at a simplified diagram of the nephron, what happens here? Well, angiotensin II acts proximally to help reabsorb sodium, which is what you want because you're trying to re-expand your volume. Now, because you have so much proximal sodium reabsorption, you get decreased distal sodium delivery. Now, as you both know, if you have high angiotensin II, you're gonna get high aldosterone levels. And again, as you know, aldosterone acts on the MR of the principal cell and causes ENAC-mediated sodium reabsorption. And with that, you get efflux of potassium and uh, acid. Now, the key here is because you have decreased distal sodium delivery, you actually don't have much sodium uh, flow through the ENAC channel because there's just not that much sodium reaching there. So that's why these patients don't often get hypokalemic because you're not gonna have much efflux of potassium or acid because you have so little um, sodium coming in through the ENAC channel. So in renin-dependent aldosteronism, due to volume depletion, you get optimal sodium reabsorption and volume expansion, which is what you physiologically would want, decreased distal sodium delivery, and therefore minimal potassium excretion. There's examples of this in nature, and the one that's been most well studied is this tribe in uh, near Brazil called the Yanomami tribe. Um, and they've been studied over the years because their diet is very unique. They have almost zero salt in their diet, like almost no sodium in their diet. Um, and so that they've been so scientists have studied over the years, how do they survive with such low salt intake? And just to give you an exa uh, example of that is this was a study done where they looked at their 24-hour urine sodium excretion, which reflects their dietary intake. So they have about one millimole a day compared to us, where it's about 180 a day. So you can see the huge difference there. Now, what happens with them? Well, going back to that last slide of the physiology, they should rev up their renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and they do. So they're 
plasma reading activity is 13 compared to ours, which is less than one. And their 24 hour urine auto excretion is 74 compared to our, ours that is about seven to eight. Now, just to give you a reference here, the diagnostic criteria for primary aldosteronism is 12. Um, so, and there's a 75, but that's in this, that 12 is in the setting of high sodium intake. Um, so there's, this is appropriate in their state of low sodium intake. Now with this high aldosterone levels, are they, are they more hypertensive than us? And the answer is clearly no, their blood pressures run lower than ours. The one other kind of fun fact about this group is if you go to the same area of Brazil, there's this pit viper, um, which its venom is how we discovered ACE inhibitors. And I'll read this excerpt to you where they say that over thousands of years, the same environmental pressures that forced the Yanomami tribe and other terrestrial animals to evolve a hyperactive ras also led this viper to conserve an efficient killing mechanism that targeted its enemies' hemodynamic vulnerabilities. The bradykinin potentiating peptides that would become the first ACE inhibitors were in essence the viper's weapon of choice in a predator-prey arms race. So this is the perfect venom in the setting where the Yanomami people are completely reliant on a hyperactive ras system to have ACE inhibitors as a, as, a, as a poison. Now contrast that to primary aldosteronism. So this is renin independent, which is the key. So these people are gonna chronically be volume expanded. So you have this autonomous source of aldosterone coming from the adrenal glands, which causes volume expansion and sense, that's sensed by the kidneys. And so you suppress renin and angiotensin too. Going back to our diagram here, now you're not getting this proximal sodium reabsorption so you're gonna get increased distal sodium delivery. And now you're gonna have aldosterone binding the MR and causing a ton of sodium influx through the ENAC channel. And you'll get a lot of efflux of both potassium and acid. So as I'll talk about, this leads to cardiovascular and kidney disease. So you get increased distal sodium delivery, increased sodium reabsorption, volume expansion, and high blood pressure. You get hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis and cardiovascular and kidney disease. And so if you look at these patients prior to targeted therapy, so prior to MR antagonists or adrenalectomy, independent of blood pressure, they're at much higher risk for cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. And that's why early recognition and treatment is indicated. And I'll show you a, um, a meta-analysis that was done a couple of years back where they looked at cardiovascular outcomes. And these are studies where they compare primary aldosteronism to essential hypertension and you can see there's studies where they're matched based on blood pressure, and they looked at these different outcomes. Um, and you can see that all of these studies will show that primary aldosteronism has, causes about 77% higher odds for coronary disease, independent of blood pressure compared to uh, central hypertension, two and a half fold higher odds for stroke, two fold higher odds of congestive heart failure, and three and a half fold higher odds for atrial fibrillation. So changing gears a little bit, is there an unrecognized spectrum of primary aldosteronism? So I'm gonna go back and forth between this figure to um, describe this phenomenon. So this is kind of a severity spectrum of renin-independent aldosteronism. And so if you look to the far right, this is the most severe form. And this is what we classically think of as primary aldosteronism. So patients with severe hypertensive disease. And if we test them, they test positive. Um, so I'll call this overt primary aldosteronism. What I'm interested in is looking at the more mild end of the spectrum, which affects a much broader population. So these are patients with mild hypertension or normal tension where guidelines say we shouldn't even screen them for this condition. But as I'll show you, there's a lot of people that meet these criteria that actually, if you test them for primary aldosteronism, they test positive. So I'll call this unrecognized yet biochemically overt primary aldosteronism. So here's some examples of that. So um, this was a study that was done in Italy a couple years back where they took 1,600 uh, consecutive Italian primary care hypertension patients when they were first diagnosed before starting medications. And they just screened everybody that met this criteria. So 232 screened positive, and then they did confirmatory testing, and 99 were confirmed to have primary aldosteronism. So that's 6% of, of this population. And as I'll show you here, Based on blood pressure, primary aldosteronism was, yes, it was present in patients with severe hypertension, but it was present in more mild hypertension, even pre-hypertension. So these are the patients we would often think to screen of overt primary aldosteronism. But the people in these groups are kind of this unrecognized yet biochemically overt PA because we wouldn't even think to screen them based on guidelines until they progressed much later. 
just to give you, just to orient you, the blue represents unilateral disease and the orange represents bilateral disease. So you can see there's a mix um, across all blood pressure levels. This has been shown in other studies as well. So this, uh, the one, the study on top here was done in Chile where they did a similar uh, study design where they took 609 hypertensive patients, screened them all for primary aldosteronism and they got almost the same value. So about 6% had primary aldosteronism and there was a spread from stage one to stage three hypertension. Um, the bottom one is a study we did in Boston where we took 241 uh, stage one hypertensives on no treatment. Again, screened them all and did confirmatory testing. Here we found on a smaller population, we found 19% had primary aldosteronism. Now that was, those were patients with kind of more, more mild forms of hypertension. Now how about people with normotension? So this was another study we did in Boston where we took 210 um, normotensives, but they all had a suppressed renin. Again, that's a requirement for a positive screen for primary aldosteronism. Here we did kind of the opposite order where we did confirmatory testing. Um, so 14% of these patients had confirmed PA, and these are normal tense of individuals. And then we went back and looked at, was their ARR positive? So only 6% had a positive ARR, which tells you that the ARR may not be the most sensitive um, screening test if there's cases, there's more cases than we're, test, than we're screening positive. The study on the bottom was done in Greece, which is a really interesting study where they took 100 normotensive individuals. And again, they started with confirmatory testing. So they confirmed that 13 of these 100 individuals had primary aldosteronism and they're normotensive. Then they followed them for the next five years to see, did the, were they at higher risk for developing hypertension? And sure enough, they were at much higher risk. So of the 13 who were confirmed primary aldosteronism, 85% developed hypertension within the next five years compared to the 87 that didn't uh, have primary aldosteronism, only 23% developed hypertension over the next five years giving an odds ratio of over 18. So it seems to have a huge effect. And this study came out in Annals just a few months ago um, where they looked at 24 hour urine aldosterone excretion. So this is again, a confirmatory test for primary aldosteronism. And they looked at this across several different study, uh, centers in the US and they looked at it in a variety of populations. So normal tension, stage one hypertension, stage two hypertension and resistant hypertension. And what they found was that the prevalence of primary aldosteronism based on confirmatory testing in normal tension was 11%, stage one hypertension, 16%, and in stage two and resistant hypertension, 22%. So these are huge numbers. Um, when they look back and look at the ARR, again, it was pretty poor at detecting biochemically overt PA, at least based on the thresholds we currently use for the ARR. It's not a very sensitive test. So, we filled in kind of the middle category here of patients that test positive for primary aldosteronism but have more mild phenotypes. Where I'm interested in going in the future is looking even further to the left here. So these are typically patients with mild hypertension or normotension. And I call this subclinical primary aldosteronism. So these patients, if you test them for primary aldosteronism based on the thresholds we have now, they don't test positive. But I'll show you that there's ways we can detect autonomous aldosterone secretion in these individuals still. And they don't have the obvious clinical phenotype. So I'll look at this in terms of both um, aldosterone and renin. So in terms of aldosterone, we're looking for inappropriate or dysregulated aldosterone secretion. So there's studies where they, they've sodium loaded people. So they put people on a high salt diet and what should happen when you're salt loaded? Well, obviously you should suppress your RAS activity. Um, and you can see that this, there's this smattering of the population where yes, some people, a lot of people do suppress, but a lot of people don't actually. And when you sodium restrict patients, so this would be like the Yanomami where your RAS should be hyperactive. And you can see for a lot of people that it is, but for some people it's not. And there's this huge spectrum within the population. So there's this broad, broad distribution of the ability to physiologically suppress and stimulate ALDO. So what determines this and does it matter? So when we, again, here we're looking at sodium loading. So when your uh, RAS should be suppressed, and so we, this was a study um, in Boston where we looked at number of metabolic syndrome components. So we looked at blood pressure, cholesterol, um, glucose intolerance, those sort of things. And we compared it with what their serum and urine ALDO levels were. So again, the normal physiologic response would be to suppress your ALDO in the setting of sodium loading. And you can see that the people that were able to suppress um, their ALDO had lower number of metabolic syndrome components. Those who were not, able to suppress had higher uh, metabolic syndrome components. 
these are patients that don't have primary aldosteronism because you can see the, th the threshold there. So greater autonomous aldosterone secretion associated with more uh, cardiometabolic risk factors. Then we did the opposite where we looked at sodium restriction. And again, this should be like the Yanomami where you, your rash should be hyperactive. And you can see that the people who were able to rev up the RAS system um, up over here had the lowest number of metabolic syndrome components. Those that were not able to were the ones that had the higher number of metabolic syndrome components. So impaired aldosterone stimulation associated with greater cardiometabolic risk factors. So this is just to summarize that. So when you're sodium loaded, the normal response is to um, suppress your RAS system. And it's abnormal if you cannot. When you're sodium restricted, you should stimulate your RAS and it's abnormal if you can't. So that's ALDO. Renin is the other marker we've looked at. So renin is a biomarker for MR activity. So this dates back many years. So this is a study from The Lancet in 1975 where um, Victor Adlin took healthy normotensive medical students, nurses, and lab technicians and studied them while they ate their customary unrestricted diet. He then took 42 of these individuals and studied them after consuming a 10 milli equivalent sodium diet for three days. So that's an extremely low amount of sodium intake. Then he looked at their blood for plasma renin activity. It was drawn at noon after four hours of ambulation. So what is he measuring there? Well, he's measuring their maximally stimulated renin because he's sodium restricting them and checking them uh, after four hours of ambulation. What he found was that renin activity after sodium restriction, a more sensitive indicator of renin suppression, showed a significant negative correlation with blood pressure. So if you were able to stimulate your renin, you had lower blood pressure. The reason I bring that up is it's, um, we basically replicated this study a few years back in Boston on kind of a larger scale. So we took 663 individuals, excluded anybody with overt primary aldosteronism. And we, again, sodium restricted them and measured their renin uh, with upright posture to measure their maximally stimulated renin. And our hypothesis based on this was that if you were able to appropriately stimulate your renin, you would have normal physiology. If you weren't able to, we call this inappropriate excess MR activation. And then to test our hypothesis, we converted all these people from a low salt diet to a high salt diet. And then we measured autonomous aldosterone, aldosterone secretion by the ARR in 24 hour urine aldo excretion. We measured vascular phenotypes in terms of blood pressure and renal plasma flow. And we looked at potassium handling, both in the serum and the urine. And this is what we found. So again, the normal physiologic responses in green, those that were not able to stimulate the renin are in red. And you can see that the, the group that we hypothesized would have inappropriate or M excess MR activity had higher blood pressure, higher ARRs, and higher 24-hour urine aldo excretion. Again, well below the threshold of calling this primary aldosteronism, but it's still present. And we saw what you might expect in terms of uh, potassium handling, that they had lower serum potassium, but higher uh, urine potassium excretion. So in individuals without overt primary aldosteronism, renin suppression may be a biomarker for a phenotype that is enriched for subclinical autonomous aldosterone secretion and MR activation. And going back to uh, Dr. Adlin's study from 1975, he wrote, does the evidence favor feedback suppression of renin because of the hypertension or because of the presence of another factor such as mineralocorticoid excess. Many characteristics of these patients suggest mineralocorticoid excess. Study of the relationship between renin activity and blood pressure in normal subjects of varying ages will be of interest. So just kind of interesting how the two studies tie together. But what this is showing is that there's a continuum of renin independent aldosteronism in normal tension. Now the question is, is this a continuum of physiology or is this actual pathophysiology? And what's the relevance to human health? So we're pretty early in answering those questions, um, but I will point out one study that was done a few years ago where they looked at a suppressed renin phenotype in normal tension and seeing, does this increase your risk for incident hypertension? And again, the presumption is that this would be MR-mediated hypertension. So this study was done using the MESA cohort where they looked at 850 untreated normotensive patients. And the way MESA was designed is that the individuals had two follow-up visits. So one at two to three years and one at three to five years. And the investigators just asked the simple question of did these people develop hypertension over that time frame? So the 
they basically divided them at time zero into suppressed renin phenotypes, which would be PRA less than 0.5, an intermediate phenotype, and an unsuppressed, which would be greater than one. And so this is what they found in terms of incident hypertension um, over the five years of follow-up. So the suppressed renin phenotype, this is the ones that were presumed to have subclinical primary aldosteronism. So they had 85 cases per thousand person years. Now compare that to people who had intermediate or unsuppressed renin. Their risk for incident hypertension was much lower. So about a 70% higher risk for incident hypertension over the five years of follow-up if you had this subclinical primary aldo phenotype. So renin independent aldosteronism and normotension. Renin suppression associates with increased risk for incident hypertension and presumably via inappropriate MR activation. Now I'll point out that we're looking at this in terms of normotension and mild hypertension. This concept of subclinical primary aldosteronism is pretty well established now in resistant hypertension. And this was done largely through the Pathway 2 study, which came out in 2015. And this is where it became really popular to basically kind of standard of practice to have spironolactone as your fourth line add-on agent for resistant hypertension. So the way they designed the study was they had patients with resistant hypertension and cycled them through fourth line add-on therapy between spironolactone, doxazosin, and bisoprolol. And they found that spironolactone had the best blood pressure lowering effect. An often overlooked part of the study is when they looked at the spectrum of renin and how this, um, the effect of blood pressure medications differed based on what your renin level was. So this bell-shaped curve that you see here is the renin distribution of the population. And you can see the blood pressure decrease with spironolactone in red, doxazosin in green, and bisoprolol in blue. And you can see if you have a suppressed renin on this end of the spectrum, these are the patients that had a huge benefit from being on spironolactone versus the other agents. If you go to the other end of the spectrum where renin is not suppressed, it didn't really matter which blood pressure medicine you were on. It's all roughly the same. There was a follow-up to the Pathway 2 study a couple of years ago where they looked at this uh, kind of pathophysiology and more in, in depth. And so they looked at it in terms of renin, aldosterone, and ARR. And so the, the line here represents your blood pressure decrease with either spironolactone or amylaride. Now again, if you have a low renin, you have, those are the people that have a huge um, decrease in blood pressure with spironolactone or amylaride. The higher your aldo is, the lower your, the greater the blood pressure effect is with those medications. And the higher your ARR is, the greater blood pressure response. And this is a continuous spectrum. It's not like your ARR meets a certain threshold and then you have benefit from these medications. It's a continuous spectrum. So resistant hypertension commonly due to inappropriate autonomous aldo secretion. So we filled in this chart here. Um, and so I'm really interested in looking at this subclinical form of primary aldosteronism going forward. And I think some of the next questions are cardiovascular risk. We know, as I showed you earlier, this overt group has very high cardiovascular risk and kidney disease risk. What is the risk with this population that of subclinical primary aldo? That's something that needs to be answered because it may guide how we treat these patients going forward. So I'll wrap up here by talking about how should primary aldosteronism be treated. So I'll give you another vignette. So say you have a 56 year old woman with worsening blood pressure, so 170 over 100. So given the very high blood pressure, you screen for primary aldosteronism and you get a serum aldo of 600, direct renin of one, giving you a very high ARR of 600 and her potassium is 2.9. So this is a slam dunk primary aldo case. You do confirmatory testing anyway and with oral salt load and it's positive for primary aldosteronism. So as I discussed, the next step you want to figure out is if one adrenal gland or both affected because it may change how you would treat them. So you do adrenal vein sampling and the disease does not lateralize, which means it's bilateral. So you start on spironolactone 50 milligrams a day. She comes back to see you a year later. Her blood pressure is better now. It's 135 over 85, still on the spironolactone, but also now on amlodipine 10. Now you repeat aldo and renin levels. So you get an aldo of 500 and a renin of 2.4 and a potassium of 3.7. So my question for you is, is medical treatment optimized? Um, will we reduce the re risk for adverse outcomes in this individual? And what is the goal for medical therapy? So what is the goal when we start somebody on an MR antagonist? Is it to normalize blood pressure, normalize potassium, or do we need to have a marker of a efficient MR blockade, which I'll talk to you more about, but it would be the marker that's been proposed is following renin levels, and should we be following renin until it becomes elevated or unsuppressed?
So if you look to the guidelines to help you answer that question, it won't answer it for you. So they're, they basically say, if you have bilateral disease, start an MR antagonist, but it doesn't give you a sense of what to target in terms of blood pressure, potassium, or renin levels. So if you go to the traditional treatment dogma for primary aldosteronism, this has been present for decades and decades and has not changed. So again, it's if you have unilateral disease, the recommended treatment is surgical adrenalectomy. If you have bilateral disease, the recommendations is sodium restriction in the diet and lifelong MR antagonists. And typically, clinicians use it to just normalize blood pressure and potassium. But I'll tell you, this is just dogma. There's no level one evidence for this. There's been no randomized control trials. And in terms of like robust cohort studies, until recent years, there was no great evidence for why, um, why this was established. So we have done some studies over the last few years where um, we wanted to answer two main questions. Do MR antagonists and surgical adrenalectomy adequately prevent adverse outcomes? And does renin serve as a clinically useful biomarker of adequate MR blockade? So the line of thinking here of using renin as much as is kind of like how we use TSH and thyroid disease, as you can tell how well you're actually treating the disease by looking at a kind of a precursor hormone to see that you're getting the effect you want. And I'll talk more about that um, as we go along. So the way we designed the study, this was done um, where we looked at, we've, we looked through about 1,200 records of patients that were coded as having primary aldosteronism. And we went through the charts individually to make sure that the, that the, the workup was actually consistent with the, that diagnosis. So we ended up with um, 602 patients treated with MR antagonists, and we excluded anybody with prior cardiovascular disease as well. So it's about 600 that were treated with MR antagonists and about 200 that were treated surgically. And we had a large group of control group of, pa of patients with essential hypertension uh, with no prior cardiovascular disease that were matched based on age and blood pressure. And you can see how these groups line up in terms of the group on MR antagonists and essential hypertension, where they're relatively comparable, though the potassium is lower in the primary aldo group, as you'd probably expect, but their blood pressures were similar and number of antihypertensive medications were also similar, as were other typical um, cardiovascular risk factors. So what we wanted to look at is once you started an MR antagonist or got adrenalectomy compared to somebody of similar age and blood pressure with essential hypertension, what was your risk for incident cardiovascular disease? And you can see for the patients treated with MR antagonists, their risk for cardiovascular disease remains much higher than those for essential hypertension. However, if you had surgery, your risk was actually reduced compared to essential hypertension. And you can see that the risk for cardiovascular disease was nearly twofold higher for those with MR antagonists, despite being getting guideline recommended therapy. And this was true for MI, heart failure, and stroke. Now, if you had surgery, your risk was lower than that of essential hypertension. Now, I'll show you that the blood pressure was not a big driver of that. So the blood pressure was fairly similar um, over the 10 years of follow-up um, in this study. So it didn't seem like blood pressure was the best marker for disease control here. This, so that was cardiovascular disease. Um, other outcomes we looked at was atrial fibrillation, where you saw a very similar trend, where those that were treated with MR antagonists continued to have nearly twofold higher risk for AFib um, compared to those with essential hypertension. But again, those patients that were amenable to surgery and got surgery did much better. Similar uh, for mortality, where your risk for mortality was higher if you were treated with an MR antagonist, whereas if you were treated with surgery, it appears like that, that risk was mitigated. And in turn, we also looked at renal outcomes as well. So we looked at um, EGFR decline. So we basically matched these patients based on EGFR once they started their MR antagonist or um, had adrenalectomy and then looked at their prospective uh, decline in GFR. And you can see that the groups that were, that were treated with surgery or essential hypertension had fairly, fairly similar slopes. But if you were treated with an MR antagonist, your GFR went down more rapidly. And and kind of corresponding to that, there were higher rates of incident CKD in the group treated with MR antagonists compared to those treated with um, surgery or essential hypertension. Now again, thinking of biomarkers that may allow us to better treat this disease, again, blood pressure doesn't seem to be the best marker. Um, so again, we've, we've been interested in looking at renin. And so why does it make sense to look at renin? So if you go back to this physiology of primary aldosteronism, you have autonomous aldosterone secretion making you chronically volume expanded. Because of that, you suppress renin and angiotensin II. 
Now, say you put somebody on an MR antagonist. What are you doing? Well, you're blocking the interaction between aldo and the MR. You're going to decrease ENAC-mediated sodium, sodium reabsorption, which will counteract this kind of chronic volume expansion in primary aldosteronism. And if you block the MR enough, you'll actually cause a volume contraction. And with that, you'll see a rise in renin. So that's why renin may be a useful biomarker um, to follow. Again, much as I think of how we use TSH for thyroid disease, I think we might be able to use renin in primary aldosteronism to follow to make sure we're adequately treating these patients. So what we did is we went back to these studies we did before um, and wanted to see, um, did the patients whose renin remained suppressed versus became unsuppressed, did they vary in outcomes? So not all providers do this, but we found a bit less than half actually followed subsequent renin levels um, in, these, in these patients. So we looked at patients whose renin remained suppressed, which is the group in red here, or the group that their renin became unsuppressed with MR antagonists. And you can see a huge um, difference in outcomes where if your renin became unsuppressed, your risk for incident cardiovascular disease was reduced essentially to that of essential hypertension. And again, blood pressure not, was not a great marker. There wasn't much difference between um, the different groups. I will point out that the group whose renin became unsuppressed were treated with generally higher doses of MR antagonists. So some were treated with spironolactone, some were with a plerinone, and we created kind of an equivalency um, uh, ratio as well, whereas where spironolactone is generally thought to be twice as, more, twice as potent as a, a plerinone. But what you basically see is that independent of blood pressure, higher MR antagonist dose and a substantial increase in renin are associated with a lower risk of incident cardiovascular outcomes. We found this for other outcomes as well. So looking at incident atrial fibrillation, again, if your renin became unsuppressed, your risk um, for incident AFib was reduced essentially to that of um, essential hypertension. Same for mortality. So, just to kind of summarize the treatment um, part of this, the current recommended practice of lifelong MR antagonist therapy in PA, despite being treated with MR antagonists, those patients continue to have a significantly higher risk for incident cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and death, and that's independent of blood pressure. So, but MR antagonist um, therapy intensification to raise renin as a proxy for M optimal MR antagonism may help mitigate this risk. So, Obviously, we need prospective studies and even trials to kind of look at this of targeting renin um, to improve care for these patients is something that needs to happen going forward. Now, I do recognize that, especially in our population uh, of patients with CKD, it's not always possible to rev up their MR antagonist dose because of one, CKD hyperkalemia, but as well as the adverse effects of MR antagonists, especially in Canada, where we're mostly using spironolactone. A lot of men especially have side effects, which limits our, our ability to go up to too high of doses on these medications. I think the other take home message from those studies was that every one of those outcomes I looked at, the patients that had unilateral disease that got surgery did much better even than essential hypertension. So if you have a patient who is a surgical candidate, has unilateral disease, we should not be hesitating to send them to surgery. It's beneficial for their long-term health. There used to be this notion that it, it was the same of putting them on spironolactone as sending them to surgery, but I think that has really been debunked over recent years. Um, so questions going forward is how should we candidly counsel uh, patients with primary aldosteronism who receive lifelong MR antagonists about the efficacy and future risk associated with that decision? Because again, MR antagonists alone seem to be associated with higher risks. Now, maybe if we can target unsuppressed renin levels, maybe that's a, a different story. Um, question number two is, is the current treatment dogma, which again has been, is a bit archaic now, is it still appropriate? And should we uh, consider surgical adrenalectomy more often? So um, this will be my final slide, but it's just, it's gonna take you for where I think um, treatment of primary aldosteronism may be going in the future. So in red here is what we typically think of as the traditional treatment dogma for primary aldosteronism. So, if you have unilateral disease, we recommend adrenalectomy, and then you look for biochemical and clinical cure. And I will mention that when you send patients to adrenalectomy, about half of them will have cure of their hypertension, meaning normal blood pressure off all blood pressure medications. The remaining 50% have a substantial improvement. So we really should be sending patients with unilateral disease down this pathway. Now, if you have bilateral primary aldo, the guidelines say lifelong MR antagonist therapy, and we tip, most clinicians think the goal is to normalize blood pressure and potassium. 
Now, some of the studies I showed you recently was maybe we should also be attempting to raise renin um, and making sure we're adequately raising the renin by increasing the MR antagonist dose or increasing dietary sodium restriction. I think we're, other places this may be headed is because patients that get surgical treatment do so well, um, is maybe we should be thinking of expanding um, the indications for surgery, not so much for cure, but to attenuate disease. So when you send patients for adrenal vein sampling, there's cutoffs of what is to considered lateralized disease versus not. Um, sometimes you'll see that even though it doesn't meet the requirements for being unilateral primary aldo, it's still very asymmetrical on adrenal venous sampling where say the right adrenal is producing much more aldo than the left. When you have that case and you have somebody who's really young or they have other cardiovascular comorbidities or they have CKD, which may limit your ability to give a high dose of MR antagonists. Should we be considering adrenalectomy, again, not to cure disease, but to attenuate the severity of disease to make it easier to treat with lower doses of MR antagonists? Or say you have somebody that you're treating with MR antagonists and their blood pressure is persistently elevated or they remain hypokalemic despite maximal MR antagonist dosing, or they have, again, they have CKD limiting your ability to dose MR antagonists. Should we think of adding other antihypertensive medication classes, specifically ENAC inhibitors? Or again, should we go back to thinking about adrenalectomy in some of these cases to attenuate disease severity and make, making them overall easier to treat? So again, these are just where I think the future of this condition may be headed. Um, but I think this is, if we'll see over the next 10 or 20 years that the treatment for primary aldosteronism may be very different than what we, than what, than what we think of currently. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Greg. That was a uh, great um, revisiting of an old problem with a new perspective. And so that was really terrific. Uh, there were some questions in the chat box. Um, so I'm going to ask one of them on behalf of, I'm not sure who, because it was anonymous, but is there, um, in terms of characterizing who may or may not be at risk, one of the questions was, is primary aldosteronism more common in diabetics? Or is there any data on that? Or Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. And yes, there it's highly associated with diabetes. Um, so I didn't show it on those um, cohort studies that we've done recently, but we actually did one on diabetes as well. And it showed that there was a higher risk for developing diabetes in those patients as well. There's been data that's come out over recent years where um, our understanding of the pathophysiology has changed some, where it used to be thought that your adrenal gland in these patients was just secreting excess aldo. Turns out they often co-secrete cortisol as well. Um, so there was a study a few years back where they um, compared cortisol excretion in patients with um, FIO, uh, benign adrenal nodule, primary aldosteronism, and both subclinical and overt Cushing syndrome. And turns out the patients with primary aldosteronism actually had higher cortisol secretion than those with subclinical Cushings. So they have very high cortisol. So it's not as clean of a disease as we think where it's just aldose secretion. It's actually excess cortisol as well. And that's why these patients are at much higher risk for, for diabetes as well. Great. Another question, uh, and I'm just reading them out of the question and answer box, is um, how, frequently, if, how frequently do you suggest renin testing after spironolactone treatment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in theory, your renin level, you should see the effect within a few days. What I have generally done is if I am adjusting the MR antagonist dose, I will generally check a month or two later or prior to the next visit, and that gives me a sense of do I need to, because I kind of tie it with when I'll be checking their potassium anyway, and that gives me a sense of, can I keep going with, with those adjustments? So I usually give it a month or two. Great. And then, so I'm going to ask you two questions just because there's lots of interest and I want to, one of the, do you guys in Ottawa have experience with radiofrequency ablation as a less invasive option for, other than surgical adrenalectomy? Yeah. And, go ahead. Oh yeah. In Ottawa, I have not seen it done. Um, we. In Boston, we had a few cases of it. Um, the, there has been a lot of debate on whether that should continue to happen or not. The benefit is it's less invasive. Um, there also used to be a lot of people when they would send them to surgery, they would just take out the nodule and they wouldn't actually take out the whole adrenal gland. Um, the field has really kind of moved away from that because it turns out there was actually quite a few cases where you would take out this big adrenal nodule or or ablate this large adrenal nodule, but then turns out that wasn't actually the source of autonomous aldosterone secretion from that gland, because there's actually these micro nodules that we don't detect that these patients have. And so that's why standard now, if you looked at kind of what's most recommended would be to, if you have 
say, right-sided disease, even if there's a clear nodule there, would be to remove the whole adrenal gland of that side. Great. And then um, Dr. Horgan on the island is asking, since hydrochlorothiazide reduces sensitivity of um, ARR, should you also hold the hydrochlorothiazide when you go to test? Yeah, I, I think I generally, if their potassium's normal, I don't. Now, with the kind of the caveat with all of these medications and how they may affect the ARR, if your suspicion's high enough um, and you think these medications may be interfering and you can control their blood pressure to enough to let the, these medications wash out of their system and retest, that's always an option. Um, I just find that these patients, by the time we're diagnosing them, it's so late that it's very hard to take them off all of the, all the potential blood pressure medications that could affect the ARR and make it a, a, the best possible um, screening time because um, it's just their blood pressure is so poorly controlled generally by the time we see them that I think you I generally focus on the medications that I think are really going to throw it off which are the MR antagonists and ENAC inhibitors um, but again you can as long as you understand the physiology you can kind of think through um, about which ones you may want to hold for a specific patient before you think about doing a washout and retest. Right. And I, there's a couple of other questions. One was um, regarding, whoops, Daisy, about um, bilateral. Uh, uh, Farine, do you want to come on? Because uh, okay, here it is. It's, um, if your venous sampling doesn't localize, um, Dr. Jin was wondering, does that mean that you have bilateral hyperplasia? And then what would, you, what would be the appropriate thing to do with that person? Yeah. Yeah. So if they have, uh, so you, the adrenal vein sampling, if you get a, it, so the one thing is you have to know, kind of look through how to interpret it because it's very, it's a technically challenging um, procedure to do. So there's a bunch of different ratios you can look at to see, did they actually adequately sample the adrenal veins? Because you often see that they'll actually be a, a sampling the IVC when they think they're in the adrenal vein and you really, it makes it changes completely how you would understand what's going on in that case. Um, but if you find bilateral disease there, that that's kind of, the category that we say now you should use MR antagonists. And again, maybe we should be targeting renin on suppression. But again, I'll point out, like I said, on that last slide where the, the cutoff for lateralization is also something that maybe we should be rethinking that where as well, because you could not technically be lateralized, but still have pretty asymmetrical disease. And if you're having trouble treating them with just MR antagonists alone, maybe somebody who is on the border of being called lateralized, maybe we should be thinking about surgery to attenuate their disease. Right, and just because we're in BC, we have Dan Holmes on the line, and um, and there were some questions about what assays are available in British Columbia in terms of things. So Dan, can you unmute yourself um, and maybe answer what, what is available? And then also, Greg, I want to come back and ask you a question about CKD and some of the nuances in the context of, of upcoming studies and various other things. So Dan, can you unmute? Or, um, uh, hello. There you are. Yeah, you're on. Oh, yeah. Um, Dr. Gundemer, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Dan Holmes here, I'm the director of uh, pathology and lab medicine at St. Paul. So, with respect to uh, assays available in British Columbia, there are two. Uh, Life Labs uses Diosorin Liaison, which is a pretty good immunoassay. It's an automated platform. St. Paul's Hospital uses TAN and Mass Spec for both aldosterone and for plasma renin activity. Now, one comment with respect to CKD is that all of the commercial immunoassays have marked overestimation of aldosterone in the context of CKD, where you're at stages three, four, and five. So quite a bit of data on that. And it's because the assays detect aldosterone's 18-glucuronide metabolite. Um, so in, in those settings, you tend to get overestimations of aldo in kind of unpredictable ways. And it may be why people kind of move towards renin measurement in those contexts, but um, I don't think that's been explored. Uh, with respect to those co-secreting cases with cortisol, you're, uh, they, I just wanted to comment that they make for very confusing adrenal vein sampling reports because you can no longer use cortisol as your normalizer. You have to kind of use a combination of clinical and, um, and uh, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the numbers ought to be in the context of co-secretion. So um, no good solution there. But anyways, uh, that's all. Thank you very much for yeah. the talk.
And then there was another um, one of the interesting questions, you know, uh, Carolyn Stigant was asking, uh, in, get, how often in your clinical practice might you recommend a pragmatic approach of just adding spironolactone to other antihypertensives in people with complex hypertension and sparing them that extensive investigation? Yeah. Including holding their meds. I guess the other and the corollary, which I might just add in just because we're running short of time, is in the context of a better understanding of CKD, hypertension, progression, et cetera, do you see a role where we would profile people phenotypically without all of the um, sort of more in invasive testing and then come up with a recommendation of a panorama of drugs addressing the various issues um, as a way to change outcomes? So sorry, it's a long question and I appreciate we're uh, getting short of time, but it's super interesting and interested in your thoughts about that. Yeah. So for the first part about the pragmatic approach, uh, I, I think it comes up quite a bit because I think the, the people that you really want to kind of put through that whole pathway of testing are people that you think may be surgical candidates, uh, because I think that's because there's a lot of a lot of people that you may just say, yeah, they, they, they're either not going to go to surgery or I'm going to, regardless of what I find and here, I'm going to do an MR antagonist and not do surgery. Like, so it's still a recommended treatment for resistant hypertension and a lot of other um, cases, so like heart failure and other things. So there's a lot of people, like say I had some elderly person, um, I know they're not going to go to surgery, but I think an MR antagonist is going to be helpful. Yeah, I won't necessarily see the need to put them through this battery of testing to um, just fulfill this kind of pathway when I know that, I, when I really think that the MR antagonist is going to be their best long-term solution, I just go ahead and, and do it. Um, in terms of kind of the second part there, um, that's a large part of my interest is profiling these people because I think if we can profile their renin-aldo phenotypes, we, we don't have, though I talked about subclinical primary aldosterone, we don't have like a clear definition of what are the thresholds that define that and we need some larger, larger kind of population-wide um, data to actually understand that. Um, and so that's where I'm interested in kind of heading going forward, especially in the CKD population where say you can detect people early, I think if you're looking for people like late stage CKD, that's probably not the population to look at. You probably want to look at earlier stage CKD where if we can identify this and intervene earlier, maybe we can actually alter their trajectory and slow down their progression. Because uh, I think I think we probably all agree that we need to find solutions to like individualizing treatment to slow CKD for, for individual people versus using this kind of one size fits all approach. Right. And the very last question is, how do, you, how do you usually manage the risk of hyperkalemia with spironolactone who already, in patients who are already on an ACE or an ARB, knowing the benefits? I mean, I might suggest that, you know, first of all, they don't all get hyperkalemic, which is in and of itself interesting, <laughs> but I, maybe you have a different answer. Um, yeah, that's the... So the, so I guess the the one benefit of people with this is they're they generally start with they're usually the ones who don't have the hyperkalemia issues to start with um, just based on their physiology um, so you have do have a little, tend to have a bit more room to work with um, though once they do progress in terms of CKD yeah it's it's a it's kind of a trade off and so I, this my solution is probably the same as everybody else's where it's frequent uh, checking and when especially when you're making dose adjustments to making sure you're not overshooting with their potassium. Um, and again, I think going forward is thinking of other ways to manage this about if they truly have this and thinking about surgery in, a, in kind of a broader, broader uh, amount of cases that maybe that needs to be thought of more because yeah, we are, we do reach our limits in terms of what you can do with MR antagonists. Now, some of the new potassium binders, maybe they have a role in this as well um, in, in our ability, but I think that kind of is to be seen going forward. Right. Well, listen, Greg, you know, I, I want to thank you very much for an incredibly uh, like really well put together talk, but also stimulating so much discussion. We had uh, at a peak 48 people from around the province, uh, which I would never think we would have got if we had an ordinary rounds. Um, nephrologists, trainees, pharmacists and nurses. And so I think we've all learned a lot and I very much appreciate the thought and the time that you put into this talk and, and helping us. So uh, thanks very much. And maybe we'll circle back as you get more data and as we understand more about uh, aldosterone and kidney disease and progression and cardiovascular health. So thank you again and thanks everybody for attending. I think it was worth going five minutes over. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Great. Bye-bye.